Thank you for joining me. Today, I'm going to tell you about the first Americans killed in Laos during the Vietnam War, who they were, the circumstances of their death, and what was happening in Laos at the time, because these men are more than just a statistic or a name or star on a CIA memorial wall. They are real Americans with families who were trying to do the right thing for the right cause. They live today in memories, and I want to take some time not just to honor them and their families, but there is some very interesting history here I want to share with you. Now, before I do, I want to ask, do you know who the first American Armed Forces casualties were in the Vietnam War? I bet you don't. And in fact, if you do a Google search, almost assuredly, you'll come up with the wrong answer. So that's your first hint. Don't be satisfied with the first results you get. I'll tell you the answers towards the end of this video. Now, the very first American death, not Armed Forces death, due to the Vietnam conflict was a civilian, James B. McGovern, the legendary earthquake magoon, a CIA civil air transport pilot who was flying supplies to the beleaguered French at Din Binh Phu and crashed in Laos in 1954. We had active duty U.S. Air Force personnel on the ground in Vietnam in 1954. They were flying missions and conducting military activities in support of the French, so we were in conflict there. I won't talk about Earthquake's death, as I have already published a video on Earthquake, as Chris Corbett and I laboriously journeyed for days to find his crash site in northern Laos near the Vietnam border. As far as I am aware, we are the first and only Westerners to visit his crash site other than the American POW MIA team who excavated the site and repatriated his remains 22 years ago. Let's begin here in May 1961. The conference in Geneva to neutralize Laos has just started that month. Officially, there is a ceasefire in Laos during this conference period, but on the ground, the North Vietnamese and Patet Lao have been aggressively attacking the Hmong and Royal Lao forces to seize as much terrain as possible so that they will occupy more ground once the agreement is eventually signed so that they can keep that ground. The U.S. through the CIA and Air America had actively begun arming Vang Pao's forces just four months earlier in January 1961. That same month, a 12-man U.S. Army team from the 1st Psychological Warfare Cywar, Battalion U.S. Army Special Warfare Center at Fort Bragg deployed to Laos as part of a secretive small-scale U.S. Army Special Warfare presence to conduct U.S. information operations. Additionally, in Laos, the U.S. Special Forces teams had been in country on Operation White Star, initially called Hot Foot, beginning in July 1959, helping to train Hmong and conduct other special operations activities. The Thai Peru are also in Laos at this time, working with U.S. Special Forces White Star teams as part of this same effort. So this is the context and time period we will start, but for a finer context, let's jump back just a few weeks. On March 23, 1961, eight U.S. Army and Air Force personnel boarded a C-47 in Vien Chan, Lao, bound for Saigon. En route, the aircraft conducted aerial reconnaissance over the Plain of Jars and was hit by enemy ground fire and crashed. Seven of the eight American servicemen were killed, shown here. DPAA told me, that those are our POW MIA folks, that the Vietnam News Agency archives has photos of the immediate aftermath of the incident and of the deceased crew members. 
Four of those seven men are accounted for, three remain missing. Miraculously, Army Major Lawrence Bailey was captured and made a Patet Lao prisoner until he was released in August 1962, probably due to the signing of the Geneva Agreement the month prior. I found this notation on a military-related website, and it is wrong. Bailey was not the first American POW in Southeast Asia since World War II. You may read online in several places that the Patat Lao never released a U.S. prisoner. Not quite true. This is the one exception. Six days later, on 29 March 1961, Air America pilot Clarence J. Abadi led a flight of 16 Air America UH-34s from Bangkok to Air America's new forward operating base at Udon Thani Royal Thai Air Force Base in northeastern Thailand, 40 miles south of Vien Jan. The helicopter forces soon became the core airframes involved in supporting Hmong engaged in a fierce battle with the Patet Lao at Padong. The reason I included this information is because this event was the modern birth of Udon Thani and the airfield. According to a base history, I believe written by Abadi, when they ferried the helicopters there, the streets were unpaved, all the food places were open air, there was one single passenger vehicle in town and only one bar. The airfield was a 5,000 foot concrete runway, although the Japanese previously had a grass strip there during World War II. There was no terminal and the 100 or so Air America workers that arrived lived in pitched tents along the taxiway and refueling was from one hand pump and 55 gallon fuel drums. Nine days after the C-47 crash on the Plain of Jars, a small Bird Dog 01 took off from Luang Prabang Airport. Aboard was United States Information Services, or USIS, Chief in Military Region 1, Mr. Francis P. or Frank Corrigan. He was working with the U.S. PSYOP team I told you about earlier that arrived in Laos in January 1961. Here is a map showing the deployment locations of the 12-member Army PSYOPs team. Corrigan was to conduct a leaflet delivery mission. Here you see some of the 1950s era USIS leaflets in Laos. Shortly after takeoff on 1 April, the Cessna 01 Bird Dog engine failed and crashed, killing Corrigan. He became the eighth U.S. fatality in Laos. U.S. effort in Laos continued with U.S. Special Forces as part of the White Star effort training and assisting the Lao. Some teams remained attached to Lao units on the front line, often amid heavy combat. As Ken Conboy in Shadow War relates, perhaps none had been placed in a more precarious position than Team Moon. Headed by Captain Walter Moon, the team was assigned to a Lao unit, which by 22 April had inched up Route 13 near Vang Vieng. On 22 April, just three weeks after Corrigan's death in Luang Prabang, this team from the U.S. Army 7th Special Forces Group was operating alongside the 6th Battalion Infantry, Lao, north of Vang Vieng. Suddenly, it came under heavy artillery barrage from the Patet Lao. The Patet Lao quickly overran the Lao Battalion. Captain Walter Moon was captured.
to other team members, Sergeant Gerald M. Biber and Sergeant First Class John Malcolm Bischoff, jumped onto an armored vehicle in their effort to avoid capture. As the vehicle took off, it came under heavy enemy attack, and a survivor said the two team members riding on it were killed. Moon, Biber, and Bischoff remain unaccounted for. Meanwhile, the CIA was heavily focused upon Vang Pao, training his forces and supplying them. Vang Pao had chosen this little mountain valley of Padong to settle 300 of his fighters who would receive the CIA weapons and training, and of course, their families. The Patet Lao began attacking Vang Pao's forces at Padong almost immediately, and small skirmishes with deadly results were occurring in January 1961. Vang Pao, meanwhile, was going from village to village to gain recruits. The U.S. had developed aggressive plans to seize the Plain of Jars just north of Padong, but then, in April, the Bay of Pigs fiasco occurred and the U.S. backed down. These plans were abandoned. A combination of Patet Lao North Vietnamese and neutralists were attacking the Hmong at Padong while Air America was conducting the resupply. On 30 May, Air America helicopter pilots Charles Matier and Walter Wisbowski, former U.S. Army pilots, were flying a H-34 helicopter in bad weather while trying to land supplies at Padong. They flew straight and level into a huge tree on a mountainside and the helicopter's rear components were shoved forward, demolishing the cockpit. Interestingly, U.S. Army Special Forces Sergeant Jano Seki, Flight Mechanic Dale Klong, and a Hmong guide were also flying in the H-34, but Jano Seki and Klock were thrown clear of the crash and survived. It is unknown what happened to the Hmong guy. If he survived, he probably left the scene. This crash had not been the first Air America H-34 crash in the Padong area, but it was the first resulting in death. Months earlier, Vang Pao, his people, a Peru team, and others had been on the run from Ta Viang to Padong after being pressed by the Patet Lao. CIA paramilitary officer Bill Lair, who had first met Vang Pao at Ta Viang, was now flying upcountry to locate Vang Pao at his new high mountain location at Padong. The pilot I told you about earlier, Clarence J. Abadi, was flying Bill Lair and they crashed into a high mountain ridge. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Lair then tells a humorous story found in his book here. He says, quote, We had crashed only a few hundred yards from a small Hmong village, Ban Kang Kai. The village chief, the Naibon, soon came running up on leathery feet with the splayed toes typical of mountaineers who had never worn shoes. He was wide-eyed at the sight of the upended helicopter and immediately told me he had no desire to ride in one. I got the impression that he thought our bird had landed the way helicopters always did. The enemy at this point were pressing upon Padong so hard, CIA officer Jack Shirley recommended evacuation of Padong, and so, with Bill Chance's White Star Special Forces team and the Hmong contingent, and almost certainly the Thai Peru, all began a 15-hour trek through the mountains with Shirley carrying a Hmong baby and rifle, and White Star medic Doc Wheeler heroically carrying two Hmong children on his back to safety. That ended the next day at Pakao, the Lao word for White Cliff, some 10 miles to the southwest where the Hmong set up base. Here is a fly through from Padong to Pakao.
For orientation, here was LS5 Padong, LS14 Pakao, and Longcheng, the CIA Mong and Thai headquarters. It was here at Pakao that the CIA, with officers Jack Shirley and Bill Young, who had been at Padong, began operating with Vang Pao to continue the Hmong training, along with Thai, Peru, and White Star teams. Air America continued supplying the Hmong at Pakao. On August 13th, Air America pilot Norwood Forte, 44 years old, and co-pilot Roger Sarno, 30, were flying a C-46 to aerial drop supplies at Pakao. Forte was an experienced pilot and had flown 48 airdrops over Dien Bien Phu to the besieged French in 1954. In the back were three Air America employees, all rugged, adventurous young men from the American West. All had been smoke jumpers, and I'll remind you that during this period the CIA recruited over 100 smoke jumpers for CIA service overseas. If you don't know the story, I tell it here in this video. It began when the CIA sent two operatives out west in the early 1950s to attend smoke jumper parachute training. When they returned to CIA headquarters, they said there was no need to send personnel to that training. Instead, the agency should recruit smoke jumpers for service. And so the CIA did. The three young men were parachute drop officers, PDOs, or commonly called kickers, kicking cargo out of Air America aircraft as it flew over designated drop zone. None of their families even knew they were in Laos, and probably, like most Americans, would not have known where Laos was. Dave Bevan, a Missoula, Montana jumper from Mineral Lake, Washington, and Daryl Eubanks and John Lewis were both from La Pazas, Texas, and they all were in their mid-twenties. Lewis had packed a lot of living into his 25 years. Bronc and bull riding in Texas, smoke jumping in Idaho, working for the CIA at the Bay of Pigs invasion against Cuba, night resupply missions over Tibet, and now many similar missions into northern Laos in support of General Vang Pao's anti-communist Hmong army. Eubanks and Lewis were friends and classmates, 1954 graduates of Lampasas, Texas High School. During Lewis's tenure at Lampasas High School, where he had excelled as a scholar and athlete, he had heard stories from an older friend about fighting forest fires in Idaho. The story that fascinated him the most was the one about smoke jumpers. Being a somewhat adventurous soul anyway, John decided he was going to be a smoke jumper come hell or high water. At 16 years old and a junior in high school, John's plan was to head for McCall, Idaho as soon as the school year ended in May 1953. Leah, his sister, tells, on June 30, 1953, it was with great trepidation that she and her mother drove John a couple of miles out of Lampasas and let him out on Highway 183 North. Leah says, once out of the car, John told us to head for town and don't look back. Mom cried all the way home, feeling certain she would never see him again. Ken Hessel, who served in the CIA with tours in Laos, jumped and fought fires with Eubanks and Lewis for two years as a smoke jumper before all three began working for the CIA.
Eubanks was a standout student in La Posse's high school, the senior class president and member of the student council, as well as the National Honor Society. A talented athlete, he was captain of the football team and quarterback. He lettered in basketball, baseball, and track. He was voted the most popular guy in high school every year until he graduated in 1954. Eubanks attended Southwest State Teachers College at San Marcos, Texas, and law school at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. During the summer months, Eubanks would journey to McCall, Idaho, where he was a member of the McCall Smoke Jumper Crew from 1954 until 1960. This work, along with overseas employment with the CIA as a PDO, allowed Darrell to pursue his goal of a law degree Ken Hessel became a CIA employee in 1963. He knew Eubanks was a crew member in 1959, 60, and 61 on night missions into Tibet, dropping indigenous teams of men and arms and ammunition just as Lewis was. Flights into Laos were taking place at the same time. One good news story is that Hessel married Lewis's sister Leah, and they have been married 59 years. In Laos, on this 13 August 1961, low clouds filled the High Valley Bowl at Pakao. Pilots never knew which to fear most in Laos, the weather or the enemy. Lao was filled with microclimates, always unpredictable, with shearing gusts, shifting winds, quickly forming storms, and often pilots never knew the weather conditions until they entered them. You can see this geographic bowl that is Pakao and how treacherous navigating this terrain must have been. According to a history of Air America by Dick Casterlin, quote, while crews on the ground watched, fascinated, the first run resulted in a perfect drop on the runway. However, to avoid mountains and clouds and to jockey the plane into position for another drop, a steep 180-degree turn at the end of the valley was required. At the end of the downwind leg, while commencing a 180-degree turn toward final approach, it appeared to ground observers that the right engine on the C-46 oversped, causing the propeller to dramatically change pitch and thrust. The abrupt and resulting loss of control caused the plane to roll sufficiently for the left wing to clip the top of a karst. And just like that, a crash and fireball, killing all five. Enveloping fire, searing heat, and exploding ammunition prevented access to the plane. Attempts to retrieve crew remains proved difficult and hazardous as 81 millimeter mortar rounds continued to cook off for two days. Those participating in the recovery considered it a miracle that the accident did not injure or kill anyone else. Recovery teams eventually retrieved the badly burned bodies of pilot Norwood Forte, co-pilot Roger Sarno, and kickers Bevan, Eubanks, and Lewis. According to a 2017 Washington Post article about the three, when their families were told they had been killed in Lao in a plane crash, they were stunned. No one even knew where Lao was, Lewis's sister Leah said. Their deaths made the local newspapers at the time, the Lampasas Record and Lampasas Dispatch, and the Daily Chronicle in Centralia, Washington. This news shook citizens in Lampasas and throughout Texas. Back at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, officials were shaken up as well. It was worse than just losing their best and brightest to an air crash. The CIA's cover operations in Laos were now blown. Probably lots of explaining to do. This caused a change to CIA policy. No longer would the CIA direct hire PDO's kickers. Rather, this function was turned over to Air America, the CIA proprietary.
Some rather remarkable accolades would be given to the trio decades later, which I'll explain in just a few moments. Now, what was the first Air America crash in Lyle while conducting operations in that country? It's a bit of a mystery. In 1960, Air America had been supplying White Star forces at what appears to have been an American commissary on the Plain of Jars. On 26 November 1960, Air America pilot John Dexheimer in a C-46 took off after offloading supplies to this commissary and then the plane crashed, seriously injuring Dexheimer and killing the co-pilot Eddie Tong, the son of Hollington Tong, who was the Chinese ambassador to Japan before it went communist and Chinese ambassador to the U.S. from 1956 to 1958. A Chinese crewman from Hong Kong was killed also. The only place news of this crash appeared was in the Bangkok Post on 28 November 1960. And since the Bangkok Post is not digitized, other than recent years articles, it took digging and ink-stained fingers and hands thumbing old newspaper page after newspaper page for me to find it. There is no reporting on this crash anywhere, so if anyone has more details of this crash or Dexheimer, who the Bangkok Post said was from Vallejo, California, please post a comment. 56 years after Eubanks, Bevins, and Lewis's plane crash, the CIA in 2017 honored them, each with a star on the CIA's memorial wall. The CIA spokesman said it was proud to recognize the heroic sacrifices of the three operatives and that the passage of time neither dilutes their valor nor reduces the immeasurable debt we owe them. The CIA director Pompeo was at the ceremony to meet and thank the families for the sacrifice and meet them in his office on the seventh floor. Separately, the CIA also awarded Lewis the Medal for Valor posthumously for his actions during the Bay of Pigs operation. The 2506th Cuban Assault Brigade awarded Lewis the Medal for Valor posthumously. Lewis was the co-pilot on a PBY seaplane tasked with rescuing Assault Brigade fighters. Additionally, Lampasas, Texas and its VFW awarded Lewis and Eubanks with a monument in 2019 at Oak Hill Cemetery near its Veterans Memorial Monument. Now let's answer the question, who were the first American Armed Forces casualties in the Vietnam conflict? If you Google this, you'll probably will get either U.S. Air Force Technical Sergeant Richard Fitzgibbon, who was murdered by a fellow airman on June 8, 1965 at Da Nang, Vietnam, or Major Dale Buis and Master Sergeant Chester Ovenen, two U.S. Army advisors killed by enemy fire near Saigon on July 8, 1959. Fitzgibbon's son, by the way, joined the Marines and was also killed in Vietnam by enemy action, making the Fitzgibbons one of only three instances of father-son deaths during the Vietnam War. The first Armed Forces casualties from the Vietnam conflict were five U.S. enlisted servicemen kidnapped by the Viet Minh and listed as missing 11 years before U.S. Marines came ashore at the same place. We had many U.S. Air Force personnel in Vietnam in 1954 assisting the French to include piloting missions over Dien Binh Phu. These were the five servicemen. Their capture and treatment were quite interesting. Perhaps I'll tell you about it in an upcoming video because it seems the Viet Minh didn't quite know what to make of them and in fact treated them quite well. They were released a few months later after the signing of the first Geneva Agreement. Now, I'm very briefly going to show you my upcoming videos and as always, I thank you for your support.